In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 11, it reads like this. This is Jesus Christ saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what you see right in a book, He's talking to the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos in approximately 90 to 96 A.D. And send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. These are Jesus Christ's words instructing the Apostle John to put the vision that he was to receive on paper. This was to be presented for God's people at the very end of the age, the day of the Lord. This was written to seven literal churches that existed at that time. It was not four churches, not nine churches, but specifically seven. They were in existence. But why would he write to seven churches and not nine churches, not four or three or thirteen? Why was it the number seven? And Jesus Christ knew what he was doing. Let's take a look and see why he wrote specifically to seven churches and not more. Now let's turn to verse 12. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Notice the number seven once again. Not nine, not four, but seven. Each verse was a number, seven. Verse 13 to 16. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle, his head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as a sun shines in his strength. If you have a red-letter Bible, it gives the words that Jesus spoke personally. Verse 11 shows that this was Jesus speaking in vision to the Apostle John. Then verse 13 to 16, it shows the description of Jesus Christ in His glorified state. And it states very clearly that in His glorified state that He will be so powerful, energy will just radiate from His body that He actually looks like the sun in its full strength. And you and I know we've been warned every year when there's an eclipse and so on, don't go out and look up into the sun over a second because it will blind you and burn your retina out and you'll not be able to see. Every year, people are blinded by doing that. But this is Jesus Christ in His glorified state, power emanating out from Him. No human being could look at Jesus Christ and live. He said so in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1 to 4, it says very clearly that it was Jesus Christ that led ancient Israel out of Egyptian bondage and led them across the Red Sea. He fed them spiritually and physically. And it said it was Christ. And then when you turn to Exodus 20, it says, You shall have no other gods before me, Jesus, the Christ of Almighty God. Jesus is the God that the Father sent to this earth to carry out the entire salvation process. And no human being can look at Jesus Christ in His glorified state. That's why after the resurrection from the dead, Jesus would actually come in and materialize and come into human form and talk with his disciples. Exodus chapter 33. This is that same God, Jesus Christ. Exodus chapter 33, verse 17. And the Lord... 
and I'll insert Jesus Christ and be very accurate. Said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that you have spoken. You see, God was about to obliterate Israel. He wanted to see him. He conversed with him. He talked with him. Moses wanted to actually see Jesus Christ. But he said no. For you have, you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. He would not let Moses look into his eyes and into his face. And he said, I beseech you, show me your glory. Jesus Christ in person. And Jesus said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, you cannot see my face for there shall no man see me and live. I'm leading into something that will be very dramatic in a matter of moments. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me, you shall stand upon a rock. It shall come to pass, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, will cover you with my hand while I pass by. I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Jesus Christ cannot be viewed on a physical level by human beings. He's supernatural and the power that emanates from him would literally burn our eyes. It probably would melt us and our eyeballs would run down like water and our skin would probably melt off our frame. You read Zechariah chapter 14 when Jesus Christ returns to this earth. If he's in his full glory then no wonder the armies around Jerusalem, they'll melt because the energy and the power that emanates from this God being and no human being can look upon it. What I want you to see is because of the Passover and Jesus Christ has forgiven all of our sins, He's held out a blessed hope for us. That hope is that we are to become like Him. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. You and I already are glorified, but we don't have the new body. He said we are glorified because His Holy Spirit is in us. Verse 1 to 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God, Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. That's our future composition. We can see each other now, there's no problem. We're all composed of physical, we can shake hands, we can grip, some squeeze harder than others. We all see how we each groom, how we dress, our various character traits, because we can see each other. We're on the physical level. But we cannot see Jesus Christ and live because He's on a different level than us. Notice in the middle of verse 2, But we know that when He shall appear, the second coming, we shall be like Him for we shall see Him as He is. You can't see Him today. Of all the people that have ever lived, it says Moses was the most meek person that had ever lived up until that time. Moses could not see the face of Jesus Christ, the God of the Old Testament. Even in all of His meekness and His humility and His love for God and desire to obey Him, Jesus wouldn't let Him see Him because He would die. None of us are any different. We cannot see Jesus, but when He comes, you will see Him. Why? Because you and I will be changed. We'll be composed of the same thing He is. We will be in the supernatural realm, and we can see Him eyeball to eyeball 
and it will be the natural state for us at that time. No longer the physical. Verse 3, every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. Jesus Christ was that Passover lamb. He's the one that took every one of our sins, the composite sins of the world, upon his shoulders. You have not one sin at this moment. Now, if you've sinned since that Passover emblems were taken, all you have to do is go to the Father and ask Him for forgiveness of your sins, and He'll give it. He does not want any sin counted against you. 1 John 2, verse 1 and 2. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin... We have an advocate, a lawyer, someone who will intercede for us with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. You notice he didn't say we're the righteous ones. No, he was the righteous one. And as a result, he has imputed his righteousness to us. So when we're righteous, it's because of him, nothing we've done. Verse 2. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is our hope. This is the hope that is written to the seven churches. That we will be just like Jesus Christ. This is the hope that the world does not understand yet. But Jesus Christ is training individuals to serve with Him as King of kings and Lord of lords. That's why he, when He returns, His name is King of kings. He's the super kings, but who are the other kings? We are. Other people just like us. And Lord of lords. There is nothing blasphemous to say that you and I will become kings on this earth. We will become lords not like Jesus, but we will be rulers. We will be kings and priests. Revelation 5.10 And we will reign on this earth. But it's this hope that Jesus Christ has held out to us that makes it all possible. Now Revelation 1, verse 17 and 18. And when I saw him, here's John, in vision, and he sees Jesus Christ. I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Read verse 18. I am he that lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Notice and key in. On the latter part of verse 17, if you have a red letter Bible where Jesus is talking, it says, fear not. Why would we not fear? After all, the entire book, according to Revelation 1.10, is a projection forward into the day of the Lord. The most horrifying time that will ever exist, and there will never have been a previous time like it, nor will there ever be another time after it. It's a specific time in history that will be so awful Unless Jesus Christ intervenes, all flesh will be annihilated. And yet, because you and I are faithful to Him, the human species will be saved alive, not dead. Notice the word fear is number 5399 in the Strong's Concordance. It means to frighten to be alarmed. But be frightened and alarmed of what? The day of the Lord. Why? Because Jesus said He is in charge. We should not be frightened. We should not be fearful. We should not in any way be alarmed. He said, I am the first and the last. That means Jesus Christ created everything. 
He's in total charge of the outcome of everything. And if you and I are in His hand and in His grip, if we're under His shed blood, there is no reason for us to be frightened or alarmed at what is about to come. Why? Because He said clearly He has the keys of hell and of death. If Jesus Christ is alive forevermore, then He's still in control. Look at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. This is talking about Jesus Christ who was resurrected from the dead and now He has taken on the position of high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Verse 25, Wherefore He is able all to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him, seeing He ever lives to make intercession for them. He ever lives. That means we have a living Savior who will always be there intervening for us. There should be no fear. I can remember when I first received the call from God to come into this ministry. And I began to preach things that I knew other men in government positions had been killed for. I'm only human. I'm no different than anybody else. I feared. I know I feared. I would go out, I'd just joke about it, but send my daughter out to crank the car to make sure a bomb didn't blow it up. I just kidded about it, but... <laughs> But I, one day I got to thinking, Father, if I'm going to say these things to people and tell them to repent, I can't be fearful. I have to be the example. So I got down on my knees and asked God to remove all fear and let me speak with boldness because He's in charge. Something came over me, and I know it did. Nobody, nobody knows but me. I was the only one there. But peace came over me. To where right now I fear no man, and I will not fear them because there is no reason to be afraid. If our Savior has the keys of hell and death, who cares what they do to us? As the song says, it only hurts a little while, and then after that, the resurrection. So what does it matter? In Psalms 110, notice who's talking here. The Lord said unto my Lord. Here is the eternal Father that said unto King David's Lord. So one Yahweh, the Father, is talking to another Yahweh in the Hebrew language. Sit you at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And that's where Jesus Christ is today, at the right hand of the Father. All powers in His hands. So we don't have to fear a thing. Verse 2 of Psalms 110. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule you in the midst of your enemies. That's Jesus. Your people shall be willing in the day of your power. Yes, all Israel will be willing to receive him after they've been punished in proper measure. It's called the Great Tribulation. It will get their attention and they will know that only God can save this world. And when Jesus Christ descends from the heavens, and you and I following Him, then they will turn to Him and accept it. Verse 4, The Lord had sworn and will not repent that you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This is the one who says, I'm in charge. I started it all. I'm going to finish it all. And I will have every, I'll be in control of everything in between. So when you have a problem, when you have persecution, pressure coming upon you, you remember who's in charge. You're not. He is. He said, I, Jesus Christ, Melchizedek, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, has the keys to hell. Hell is number 86 in the Strong's Concordance. It means the grave. You know, every time there's a funeral... You go out to the grave site, they have a six foot deep hole, they put the body and the casket in it and cover it up with dirt. That's the grave. In John chapter 5, Jesus once again is doing the talking. 
he shows that he has complete control and there is nothing anyone can do to usurp that control and power away from him. John 5, verse 25 to 29. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. That's the resurrection, the first resurrection, those of you who have God's Holy Spirit. For as the Father hath life in Himself, that's life inherent within Him, immortality, so has He given to the Son to have life in Himself. Jesus now has immortality. It is self-regenerating. We have to fuel and stoke the coals every morning by feeding ourselves eggs and beef bacon or whatever we have, oatmeal or anything else. Then about lunchtime, the old engine begins to slow down, so we have to stoke the coal some more. And you know, I've got the strongest right arm I know of. It's an automatic reaction. You set something there and it just starts doing that, <laughs> like a hinge <laughs> with a spring on it. Well, Jesus has life within himself. We don't. Verse 27, and hath given, this is the Father, hath given him, Jesus, authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. You see, he's the Son of Man and the Son of God. He was the Son of God and came into human flesh. He was born of a woman. He was a man, God in the flesh. Therefore, he is both God and man. He was both. Verse 28, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of condemnation or judgment. Well, this is our Savior. He has power over the grave, He will resurrect from the dead. No one will stay in a grave. Every person that has ever drawn breath will come out of that grave. They will have opportunity for salvation. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 to 23 shows that there is a series of resurrections. When you look up the words in those three verses, there will be a series of resurrections and people will be taught the truth. But the first resurrection is the key for you and me. That's the one that you don't want to miss. He also has the keys of death. This word is the most distorted word that the Christian community has today. It's number 2288 in the Strong's Concordance. It literally means to die death. When you look it up in the English language in the unabridged dictionary, it means the cessation of all vital principles. The cessation of breathing and the circulation of blood. There is no vital principles. You cannot have any type of vital principles and be dead. Jesus has the key to unlock death and bring people back to life from the dead. That's why he said in Matthew 28, 18, Go into all the world. Why? Because he has all power. If he's got it all, nobody else has any. And if he delegates it to us, who can take that power away from us? No one until he says, okay, I'll withdraw that power from you and let you be a martyr. Nobody can stop us. Do you realize I'm not afraid of the Illuminati? They can't stop this ministry until Jesus withdraws his hand. And I don't care how many people rise up among us from internally and try to destroy it. They can't do it until Jesus says, you've finished the work I've called you to do. They didn't kill Paul, did they? They won't stop anybody else until that job is finished. Revelation 1, 19 and 20. Write the things which you have seen and things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. 
The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Whatever's on one side of an equal mark must equal and balance what's on the other side. Two plus two equal four, not six or eight. Therefore, seven churches equal seven angels to those churches. And the seven candlesticks which you saw are the seven churches. So seven candlesticks equal seven churches. Notice the number seven has been through all these verses that I've read so far. There must be something to this number. It must signify something. Or else why would Jesus keep saying seven, seven? Why wouldn't he use random numbers, nine, eleven, thirteen, twenty-three? No, it's always the number seven. Let's go back now to Genesis chapter 1. I'm just going to summarize the first chapter. Every one of us know that God took six days and he created. Then in chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all of his work which God created and made. And when you go to the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verse 8 to 11, it shows very clearly that it's a memorial of creation. So here God took seven days. And he created a week. I don't know of anybody that after the seventh day in that week says eight. No, they start over, don't they? So seven is a number that shows the complete week. The complete weekly cycle is finished. So the number seven shows completion. Well, let's go now to Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus 23, verse 6. The first few verses, God says to tell the children of Israel, these are his feast. And since this God was Jesus Christ, then they're still his feast because he never changes. Down in verse 6 it says, And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. It says it clearly. Seven days you must eat it. You don't just not eat leavened bread. You must eat unleavened bread. That's as much of the commandment as cessation and putting the leavened bread out of your house. But the number seven. Why is it that this holy day has seven days? What's the significance to it? It shows completeness. Here's our sacrifice, Jesus Christ, our Passover. He died and took all of our sins away. And then for seven days, we're putting Jesus Christ in us. And this shows completeness. When Jesus Christ, we eat him for seven days. He is the bread that came down from heaven. Read John 6, 7, and 8. Jesus is that bread. And here, unleavened bread, according to the Bible, and I better prove it, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, represents no sin. Leaven represents being puffed up and sin. Unleavened bread represents purity. And when we eat unleavened bread for seven days... We're symbolizing putting Jesus and all of his purity inside of us. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6 to 8. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church because they had a problem with a man who was having incest with his mother. Verse 6, your glorying is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? You know how you put a bunch of apples in a barrel and if one or two of them begins to rot, it begins to touch and rotten every apple that touches it and pretty soon the whole barrel's rotten. It's the same way. You put a little yeast in bread and it puffs it up, makes it rise. 
So it is. Verse 7, purge out therefore the old leaven. Get it out that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrifice or slain for us. Therefore, it's because Jesus was our Passover. It's because he was slain for us to forgive all of our sins. Let us keep the feast. And when you look up the word feast, it means holy day not with old leaven. In other words, we don't come into the assembly called together with our old sinful approach to life. We're getting rid of all the old ways, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So here is a physical action with a spiritual intent. The physical eating of the unleavened bread is nothing. It's the spiritual intent behind it, the unleavening of our lives. Because Jesus died for us, he's the righteous, so we eat the words of God, Jesus Christ, for seven days, and it represents completion. And then we become righteous because it's Jesus in us removing all sin and guilt and putting his righteousness in us until we are a perfected person. So seven days, once again, represents complete conversion, complete perfection on our half. Let's go back now just for a second to Leviticus chapter 23. And verse 39, because you see, we're not the only ones to be perfected. We're just the first. Verse 39, Leviticus 23, also on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you've gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. Here's another feast for seven days. On the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. So it's a separate feast. But here is a feast for seven days. What does it say in Acts chapter 3, verse 18 to 21? When the Redeemer, Jesus, comes, that's when he's going to restore all things. Who is it that has power over death? Jesus. So the number seven represents completion or the whole of something. It's totality. These seven churches of Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 represent the complete spiritual condition of the church. And when was the time setting for the book of Revelation? The day of the Lord. Some churches teach that these seven churches listed in Revelation 2 and 3, represent the history of the church from the original apostles all the way down until the return of Jesus Christ. They call them the various church eras. I have a problem with that. You know why? If that is true, do you realize that we are the Laodicean church? that is so spiritually rotten that God commands them to take eye salve and clear their eyes out so they can see their wretched spiritual condition. And I know how I live my life. I don't believe I'm in a wretched spiritual condition. And I know how some of you live your lives. I know you very personally. And I don't believe you're in a spiritual condition that's described in the Laodicean church. There's only two reasons that are ever cited for the possibility of those two churches being the history of the church from the apostles all the way till Christ returns. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10 says you'll have tribulation 10 days. And so they attribute that to a 10 year period when there was in history an intense persecution by the Roman Empire of the church from 303 to 313 A.D. 
That is their only supporting evidence. Then, chapter 2, verse 13, it mentions specifically a person, Antipas, as a martyr. And since they have been mentioned by name, they say, see, this must be a church back here at a certain time in history. I have a problem with that, too. Because God uses many times a type and an anti-type. Like Antiochus Epiphanes came in and set up an abomination of desolation in the temple. But Jesus clearly said it's going to happen at the end of the age. So it's a type and an anti-type. I'm going to believe what Jesus said. Now you can have your belief. I will not take yours away from you. But I believe Revelation 1.10 is the time setting for chapter 2 and 3. And it says the day of the Lord. I believe the number seven and why Jesus gave it is it is because the number seven, the seven churches, shows the complete spiritual condition that anyone at the close of the age could be a part of. You could fit into any of these spiritual conditions of these seven churches. And I think before I'm through, I can even prove that. But we'll see. So don't anyone come to me later and say, I disagree with your whole sermon. I'm leaving it wide open. You don't have to agree with it. But the principles which I'm going to talk about, we all have to live by. See? In Revelation 1.10, it says clearly that it is for the day of the Lord. I personally believe that these two chapters are dealing with with the church in the 20th century right before the return of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 through 7. Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he that holds, that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know your works, and your labor and your patience, and how you can bear, not, cannot bear them which are evil. And you have tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, and has borne, and has patience, and for my name's sake have labored, and have not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you, because you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from whence you are fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto you quickly, and will remove your candlestick out of its place, except you repent. But this you have, this is something that they had on their side, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. I want to make some observations about these seven verses to the church at Ephesus. Jesus Christ is personally sending this message. If you have a red letter Bible, you'll see that it's in red letters. These people received this message knowing that it was Jesus Christ, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega, that is sending this message through John. Jesus uses very wonderful psychology on these people. He tells them their good points first. He makes them feel good about themselves. They've done something worthwhile. Then he says, oh, by the way... <laughs> I've got something against you. You need to work on this. So he's showing that they must repent of certain things, but other things they're doing good. He encourages them to return to the first love of the truth that they had and do those things which they once did, which were once important to them, but they've been letting them slide and they become unimportant or secondary. Then Jesus made a startling observation. He said, if the necessary adjustments are not made, I'll have to disband that church. It's 
what he said. He would remove the candlestick. That means that church would not have the angel protecting that church. He would remove the angel. No more protection. The church would be scattered to the four winds. What were some of these good works that in the Bi these Bible followers back in Jesus' day were doing that you and I should be doing in the day of the Lord? And if we're not doing them, that means our first love has begun to fade. And Jesus said, repent. You know, the reason why I'm mentioning this is because it does say in verse 7, hear what the Spirit says to the church is, not one church. It says, listen to all the good points, all the corrections of all seven churches. Not just one. So you cannot fit yourself into just one of these churches and say, I'm this, I'm the greatest, I'm Philadelphia. He doesn't say anything bad about me. No, you may have some good points from each of these churches, or you may have some weaknesses that you see in each one of these churches. That's why he said, listen to what I'm saying to all the churches. The complete package. And measure yourself. If you measure yourself, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 26 to 32, then he will not have to correct us and chastise us if we look at ourselves and make the correction and adjustment ourselves. Let's go now and see some of the works that they did in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verse 36 to 39. The Apostle Paul had come into a city, and there was a woman who did many wonderful works. Dorcas was her name. Verse 36, Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. You know, I would like to make an observation right quick. This just popped into my mind. Because from time to time, I do have a great deal of difficulty with a lot of well-meaning, zealous people, but not according to knowledge, who come to me and say, well, you've got to speak God's name in the Hebrew language. You can never use the English language. Right here it shows that you can translate or interpret one name from one language to another. And it's not spelled alike, and it's not even pronounced alike, and it's perfectly okay. Right here in the Bible. And if anybody misses that, Tabitha and Dorcas don't sound alike, don't even look alike. Doesn't even hardly have a letter alike in it. And yet it's the same person. Verse 37. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died. Whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And for as much as Lydia was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men desiring that he, he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him to the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by weeping, and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was still with them. Notice what this woman was doing. She was doing good works for the brethren. Doing good to other people and not always saying, come serve me. But I will serve you. I will do good. Is this a true example from the Bible? As to how true Christians who are to love one another, and that's a command of Jesus Christ, should be acting? Yes, it is. Matthew 25. I'll read verse 31 to 40. This is Jesus' words. And remember, Jesus is the one talking to the churches. Verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, that's what we're looking for, the day of the Lord, and then the appearance of Christ, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. Before Him shall be gathered all nations. Why? Because there's going to be a series of resurrections. You and I with our new body are going to teach them the truth. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. 
He shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why would he say something to those people on the right hand, but he doesn't say it to the ones on the left? For I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. The inference is, I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. You know, most of us would scratch our head and say, well, when did I do this? I've never gone to visit anybody in prison. Or maybe I don't ever go visit the sick. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and fed you, thirsty and gave you drink, or a stranger, we took you in, you were naked and we gave you clothes, or you were sick and I came to visit you? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, insomuch as you have done it unto one of these least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. We should be ashamed if we live in the city of St. Louis and in this next week don't go see Marvin Miller. If you don't do it under Marvin, you don't do it under Jesus. It's that simple. That man is hurting and he's probably going to lose that leg. But then notice what he said to those on his left hand. Verse 41, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So what are some of these good works? It's simple. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I can remember a young lady laying in a hospital room. She didn't say anything then, but later she confessed. I didn't care who it was. I just wanted somebody to come see me. I don't. I didn't care if they if I was hurting so bad. I just they listened to me gripe and complain. I just wanted company. I wanted to see a human being. That was my daughter when she broke her nose and had to be in the hospital. And here's Marvin Miller sitting over there. And when you call on the phone, he, he just perks up. You take him something. He don't want to let you go. God's people need each other. And you and I must return to the first works. When we first came into a knowledge of the truth, you couldn't keep us away from Bible study. You couldn't keep us away from maybe if somebody was sick, helping them. If somebody was moving, you'd be the first one there to help them move. Anything to help somebody, you were there. I was there. And then as time went on, though, and the more we're in the church, we settle back and we don't care as much anymore. Oh, we still love the truth when we hear it, but it puts us out to do anything else. Well, I want to tell you, we'll have the whole thousand years with our new body where we can rest up from, not <laughs> from the travel we do today. Then we'll have eternity and we'll never get tired. The Scripture prophesies it in the Old Testament. When Jesus comes, He'll not grow weary. He'll not be tired. We're going to be like Him. But today, God's people are traveling people. We're so scattered. And it's an effort to get yourself ready and go somewhere to meet with His people. It just is. I know of people that drove 200 miles 300 miles just to go to a Passover service or to a feast somewhere. And then they had to turn around and go back after it was over. That's zeal. I'm not saying everybody can afford to do that. I'm not. I'm just saying what happened to those first works? Jesus told this church, you better get back with it. You better know where your heart is. You better know where this first love 
And love is not something where you just have something consumed upon yourself. Love is the outgoing feeling towards someone else of affection so much so that you want to be with them. You want to help them. You want to do for them. You want to serve them. And not just be served. No, you're not being called to be served. You're going to be called to be served or to serve forever. When you're called into the first resurrection... You will be the greatest servant in the universe. If we can't learn to serve now in our training ground, will we be qualified to serve then? I don't think so. I think we must become servants. John 14, verse 12. John 14, verse 12. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. What did Jesus do? He taught the people. What have we been instructed by all the apostles and those that wrote the books that were recorded in the New Testament? Be ready to give an answer to anyone that asks a question of you. How many of us can prove our beliefs from this Bible? How many have stored it into our memory bank so that we can pull it out? How many of us have taken this book and marked it up and taken every place in the Bible on one topic and then chain referenced it all the way through so that we can give a hope for the reason for what we're doing? He prayed for the sick. Do we do that? He healed. I realized that he had the supernatural power. None of us can do it unless he gives us the gift of healing. So that, that means we resort to prayer and his will be done in whatever he thinks is best. He prayed for the disciples to be strengthened. What are we doing? Do you realize that 95% of people who are identified with this church group are scattered individuals? They must be prayed for to be strengthened. When you're out there alone and you're the oddball in every community that you live in, it's not easy. It's very easy to let down and let the pressure cause you to compromise. You know what? Right before Passover, I had phone calls from several people saying that they were having all kind of troubles and the number one thing that came up, the whole trend of every conversation was compromise, let down, compromise. You can't do it. Either you're on God's side or you're going against Him. What else did Jesus do? He made disciples. What are we trying to do? Collectively, when we give donations and our magazine goes out and the radio program goes out and... We're trying to make disciples. We know God calls. Jesus is the one who chooses. We know that. But He also sends preachers. And He says so in Romans 10. How can we hear and understand without a preacher? And how can He preach unless He's sent? We've got enough of those that are preaching on their own that God never sent. There's a church on every corner out here and none of them preach the truth because God didn't send them. It's that simple. And when you read Jeremiah and some back in where God has talked about those prophets, I don't want to be in their shoes, but somebody has to say it. You have to live it. You have to be a light. You have to beam in your community so that people will know you're different. That does not mean you go along and cram everything down their throat and choke them to death. It simply means... You're ready to give an answer when they ask you. The problem with so many of us is, though, we like to give the answer first. <laughs> we go looking for people to give the answer to. Then pretty soon we don't have a friend, we don't have a relative that will have anything to do with us, and we wonder, what's wrong with those heathens? <laughs> no, it's this heathen. <laughs> and when God finally converts us, we'll realize what we've done. 
<laughs> oh well. Chapter 26 of Acts. I'm going to have to move along or continue next week. Acts 26. <clears throat> Verse 20. But showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coast of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God and do works, meet for repentance. What is required of us today? We've got to let the world see that we have a changed life. That we're not like everybody else. When the Sabbath day rolls around, we keep it. We don't compromise. I gave up a very... I'm not blowing my own horn. I'm, I don't know anybody else's example, so I have to use my own. I helped start a legal reserve life insurance company in the state of Alabama, the most successful in the history of this nation. It even beat Metropolitan in profits by seven years. That's how good that company was. And when I learned about the Sabbath, I gave it up. I could be a wealthy man today because of that, but I'm a poor man. But God comes first. You've got to do the same thing. If anything stands in your way of keeping God's Sabbath and His holy days, it's not worth it. Which is better, eternity or the world today? No, we've got to go back to the first works, the things that really count. We've got to show forth proof of our repentance by the life we live. No compromise. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. The Apostle Paul is talking to a Gentile church. They're converted. But you know, these words are written for us. Verse 1. Be you therefore followers of God. It doesn't say be followers of the world, does it? Let them set the example or put pressure on you and you follow them. Oh no, it says followers of God. God is perfect. He's laid down the rules, the regulations. We play by His game. Verse 2, walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given Himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Do you realize when He died... He put you and me in His place. And when this sacrifice goes up, God is smelling our righteousness because Jesus made us righteous. If that doesn't mean anything to us, we shouldn't even be here. Conversion is from the inside out. See, it's got to be from the heart. Then He lists many things of the, the natural flesh before God's Spirit comes into our mind. But fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, don't even let it be named among us as saints. Now the word uncleanness here is number 167. It means impure or demonic. Interesting. So an impure lifestyle or dabbling with demons or influenced by demons and don't even know it. It doesn't matter. You can be influenced by demons and not know it. And it says covetousness. That's number 4124. It means fraudulent or greedy practices. What is the opposite of greedy? It's love, isn't it? When you're serving others instead of being served by others, you're no longer greedy, but you learn service. That's what God wants. This group of people, back here in Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 through 7, also had another good attribute about them. God said, you try those who claim to be sent as apostles. You try them. You prove them to make sure. The word try is number 3985, and it means to Put forth proof. In other words, those people in the day of the Lord who are God's true people will check 
the Bible, every single scripture to make sure it is accurate. That's part of going back to the first love. And you prove whether a person who says, God sent me or God called me, you prove what he says is the truth from this book. When you let down, you become lukewarm. So you must prove what is biblical, what is not. He said that he had something against them. I've mentioned that, and that's the first love. He also said that he had something for them on their side that was good. They hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. What is the Nicolaitans? The word Nicolaitan comes from from number 3531, which meant an adherent to Nicholas. A man by the name of Nicholas. We can call him Saint Nicholas today, but anyway, his name was Nicholas. And it comes from another word, two other words. Number 3532, meaning victorious over the people. He was a heretic. And he set up a system of government within the church organization that caused him to be a heretic. And he enforced that system of government upon every single person within it. The two root words that this comes from is number 35, 34, and 29, 92. It means a conqueror of the people by church dictatorship. And God says, this church of Ephesus, one of the good trends was within that church that those people hated church dictatorship because here's a man sets himself up as God practically and everybody has to go through him to get to God. What has that become? A cult. A Christian cult is what it becomes. Now, if Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ, Paul always exalted Jesus Christ. Nobody could accuse Paul of being a cult leader because he always exalted Christ, not himself, see? That's who you have to follow, those that God have called that are not exalting themselves but exalting Jesus and pointing you to the book. Verse 7 of Revelation 2 is the summation to that particular church. Jesus Christ tells them very specifically that those who had an ear, those who let the Holy Spirit lead their mind, that they should listen to what He instructed to the plural churches, all seven of them. And you must glean the good that you may be doing, or the weak points that may be in your life. And let either the good or the bad, whichever it is, correct you. If you're strong in one place, Jesus isn't going to chastise you in that category. No, only where the weakness occurs, that's where you're chastised, to strengthen that particular character trait. But he does promise something. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. In Revelation 2, Revelation 2, verse 8, he's now writing to a second church of these seven, the church of Smyrna. And under the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things says the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know your works in tribulation and poverty, but you're rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried. And you shall have tribulation. Ten days. Be you faithful unto death. And I will give you a crown of life. 
He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. Once again, identifying who is doing the speaking, if you have a red letter Bible, you'll see that it is Jesus Christ. It is Jesus personally talking to the Smyrna church. He said, I am alive. I was dead, but I'm alive now. He said in verse 19 and 20 of chapter 1 that he's the one that walks in and out of all seven of these churches. So if you and I have God's Holy Spirit, and that is a prerequisite for being a true Christian, Ephesians 1 verse 12 to 14, God's Spirit in us is the down payment on a future glorified body. If God, through Jesus Christ, is walking in this church, any other church that has His Holy Spirit, that means we must listen to the Spirit. He's in control. He was alive. He's dead. But let's see what about Jesus Christ. In John chapter 17, He tells us that He had glory before He ever became our Savior. Verse 5, And now, O Father, glorify you me with your own self, with a glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus was God. John 1, 1 1-3 says so. He had glory. He looked just like He did in Revelation 1, 13-16. Then He emptied Himself of glory and took on the appearance of a man. Therefore, he has every right to gain our attention. He said, I was dead, but I'm alive. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, verse 45 to 50. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land under the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lamai sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of them that stood there, when they'd heard that, said, the man called for Elijah. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar, put it on a reed and gave him to drink. The rest said, Let be, let's see if Elijah will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up, and the King James says, Ghost. But it's number 4151 in the Strong's Concordance. It's spirit. His breath left him. He died. He was dead. But he was not to remain that way. In Matthew chapter 28... Matthew 28, verse 5 and 6. When the disciples, after the Sabbath was over, ran to the tomb, here's what the conversation was like. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He admitted he was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. He was dead, and yet he's alive. It says so in the Gospels. In Hebrews chapter 7, once again, telling his position as high priest, Melchizedek. Notice what it says in verse 27 now. In verse 25 it said he lives evermore to intercede for us. Verse 27 who needed not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. For this he did once when he offered up himself. Now, this is interesting. because Let's go back to verse 25. I want to show you that. Wherefore he is able also to save them because of that sacrifice to the uttermost that come unto him. Because seeing he lives, he ever lives to make intercession. What does the word uttermost mean? It means entirely. 
Jesus has the power to save the entirety of the human race. He has that power. We are now the first ones to trust Christ for salvation. We're the first. Ephesians chapter 1. This is so important. The next two scriptures, I hope we grasp them. Because if we grasp these, and every day that we wake and we start a new day, if we think on these next two scriptures, we will never let down in our life. Ephesians 1, verse 12 to 14. That we should be the praise of His glory, who first trusted in Christ. All those who become first fruits and the first resurrection are the ones who first trusted. In whom you also trusted after you heard the word of the truth. The gospel of your salvation. So you had to hear it first. In whom also after that you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. God seals with His Holy Spirit. It's a promise for something. Notice what that something is. Verse 14. The Holy Spirit, which is the earnest, it's a down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. God's Spirit comes into our mind as a down payment on our new, glorified, fully composed spirit body. Just like when you buy a house, you put a down payment, earnest money. Then you pay for the rest of it and you move in. God's Spirit is in our mind if we're a true Christian and that is your earnest of a new glorified body. The only one that can take that away from you is yourself. Jesus has the victory over Satan, over his demons. He has the victory over everything. The only one that can lose their salvation is you. Only you. Jesus will not let it happen if you stay within the framework which He has laid down for you. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. Starting in verse 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. He shows very clearly that the elders, the ones from the time of righteous Abel all the way down through time until the time that this book was written, had gained a good report because they believed in the promise and they did everything required to hang on to that promise so that God would never take His Spirit away from them. Why would it that Abel would be willing to die at the hands of Cain? rather than give up the truth. Why was it that Abraham would leave the cultural city of that time and go into a wilderness area and have to live in the tents? Let's face it, the first time I ever went to a Feast of Tabernacles, I camped. I have never camped again except at a Holiday Inn. Abraham camped year after year. The rain came, the sunshine came, maybe the hail came and the snow came, but Abraham camped in a tent. There was something so important to this man that he would not turn away. He did what God said. Isaac did it, Jacob, all the prophets, they're all there as witnesses that there is something important that God's doing. Moses was the second man in rank to the Pharaoh. He was the most educated man at that time on the face of the earth. He knew astronomy. He was the head of the army, the greatest army on earth. And he left it because something was so important. I want to show you what it is. Drop down to the middle of verse 35. That they might obtain a better resurrection. A better resurrection. What is this better resurrection? It's number 2909 in the Strong's Concordant. It means a stronger resurrection. More noble. And it comes from the root word number 2904 meaning the greatest. If there is the greatest, there's a lesser. 
Who would give up the greatest for something less? People do it. I cannot comprehend when God opens your mind and gives you a deposit, a down payment on the truth and on your new glorified body. And he says, I want you to be one of the greatest beings in the universe. I can't comprehend somebody saying, no, I want to be a little tadpole in a pond somewhere. I can't comprehend somebody would lose the greatest down to the least if they barely make it into the kingdom. People do it though. I don't know why. Why is it that God is taking some people today and deliberately blinding the rest of the world? It says it in the book of Isaiah that He will remove the veil that's cast over all nations when Christ comes. But why is it today He's chosen one over here, another one over here, and another one over there to be salt, which is preserving, and then a light? We're to be salt and light. We're to preserve this earth. Why is He doing it? He's doing it so you and I can be more serviceable to all humanity. This world is waiting for you. If you don't understand that yet, you don't know what God's doing. This world is waiting for the manifestation of Jesus Christ and us to receive our glorified body so we can be just like Jesus. It's waiting for us and they don't even know it. They kill us thinking they're doing God's service and Jesus Christ and us who are going to be like Him are their very hope. They don't realize they're killing their hope. But you see, Jesus has the power and the keys to death and hell. They can't keep us in the grave. Verse 9 says, I know your works in tribulation and poverty. So this particular church was very poor in worldly goods. But you're rich. They were rich in faith. They were rich in the knowledge of God's promises. Their purpose, their goal, the very reason why God lets them draw breath. They knew it and understood it. And even in their poverty and lack of worldly goods, they would not compromise. And he said, I know them. He says, I know the blasphemy of them that say they're Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. There's two ways you can look at this. I'm going to look at it one way first. If I have time, I'll mention the other. If not, I'll skip it. The word blasphemy means impious against God. Here are people saying that they are Jews. Did you know that Paul calls you a Jew? He did. Right in the Bible. He said these people were called themselves Jews, but they were not. They were of the synagogue of Satan. Romans chapter 2 will unfold some of this for us in verse 17 to 29. Behold, you are called a Jew... And he's talking to the racial Judites that were still remaining in that area. And some of them had been scattered, and they lived in other cities. He called them racial Jews. And he said, you make your boast of God. He goes on and says, look, you preach against idolatry, and yet you turn around and commit idolatry. Are you better than the Gentiles? Oh, no. You've been circumcised as a token of the covenant. Gentiles have it. You break the law, the Gentiles break it. Are you any better than they are? No. said, if they keep it and you don't, they're actually better than you. Who say you're a Jew? Verse 24. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. Why? Because they were claiming that they were God's people and they broke the law. You see? Verse 25. For circumcision verily profits if you keep the law, if you are obeying God. But if you're a breaker of the law, your circumcision is made uncircumcision. It's like you weren't even one of the Israelites at all. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? 
So if somebody's out there obeying God and they're not an Israelite and they're living by all of God's laws, they are counted as a home-born Israelite. You know what Jesus said here to the churches in the 20th century? He said, look, I know there's a lot of you churches out there. You all claim to be Jews spiritually. You're not. You're of the synagogue of Satan churches. Because you're not converted from the heart. Verse 27. And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill a law, the law, judge you? Who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? He is not a Jew, which is one outwardly, the flesh just born an Israelite. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. Circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit. And when you read Colossians chapter 2, starting down in verse 8, showing the contrast between Gentiles and the true converted person that circumcised, circumcision is an operation supernatural by God, cutting away the hostility toward God, you then become a true member of God's people, Israel. So, those back here in the book of Revelation... It said, this church knows that those people who claim to be Jews and are not because they're not circumcised in heart, therefore they've not received the Holy Spirit. Because if they had, they would be obeying God and not being blasphemous. You can blaspheme God by using His name and doing the exact opposite. They did it back in Ezekiel. Remember when the women were weeping for Tammuz and yet they were using the name Yahweh, the Hebrew name. And so they were against God. Verse 10, Fear none of those things which you shall suffer. I want us all to recognize that. He said, Fear none of those things. Don't be frightened. Because those in the 20th century are going to have the greatest purge of Christians that has ever happened in the history of the world. They have modern technology, infrared light and so on, that they can track down a mouse out in a field in the dark. You and I will not escape unless God supernaturally intervenes. And we'll see in the book of Revelation, some will be protected. But he says, fear not. Matthew 4, 8 and 9 shows that Jesus Christ went up into a high mountain and Satan said, Look, if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give you authority over all these kingdoms of the world. Satan has power over every nation on earth today. That's why he has the power and control of the military and they're going to persecute Christians. But Jesus said, Fear not. <laughs> He's got the power of death and hell. Why should we be afraid? They kill us now. We're resurrected to haunt them tomorrow. <laughs> See? <laughs> so we're going to be the ghost of past. <laughs> oh, well. And then I want to admonish you as I close the message now with verse 11. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. You will not even be subject to the lake of fire. But you will be immortal and never again will you suffer and have tribulation. Praise God, you're waiting to be like Jesus.